All right. Hey everyone. I'm Ariel Hunter. I work here at the Elkhorn Slough Reserve and I'm coming to you live today with the first installment of our new series called Weaving Yesterdays. And these are going to be a series of little live vignettes of stories from the past of Elkhorn Slough. We'll be exploring uh, the Elkhorn Slough's cultural heritage, our historical ecology, um, and the ways that humans have shaped this place over 8,000 plus years of human history out here. We'll be coming to you from a different place each week, uh, or each month, I should say, the first Saturday at 1 p.m., showcasing uh, a different story from time. So welcome. Uh, definitely feel free to throw anything in the comments if you have questions or things you're curious about, um, and we'll get started. So today, I'm going to be talking to you about the Elkhorn Dairy, which if you've been out here to the Elkhorn Sioux Reserve, um, and maybe throw a like in there if you've been out here before, uh, if you're watching, if you've seen those dairy barns that are out here, you know that that was a, a big part of the history out here. But we're going to take a look at the, the deeper story behind that. So I've got some cool artifacts that I'll share with you at the end. But for now, let's take a look over at the dairy itself. So I'm out here at the overlook. And in the distance, you can see our two barns. Now, this place, the Elkhorn Slough Reserve, our property was originally all marsh. So everything that you see out in front of us, all of that water that's on our side of the railroad tracks, that used to be all salt marsh and mud flat with hundreds of waterfowl um, that we see every year coming in and feeding and hanging out in it. And there was a gun club actually out at Hummingbird Island, which you can just see off in the distance past the two barns. Now, in 1906, J. Henry Mayer uh, came in and he actually purchased about 400 hectares of land, kind of just adjacent to Hummingbird Island there. And his goal was to set up a dairy. So he established it with uh, his son-in-law and business partner, Frank Buck, um, in 1906. Now, when you want to establish a dairy in an area that is full of mud, you're already going to have a, a lot of problems because this, this wasn't grassland, this was marshland, it was muddy, it was soggy, uh, not necessarily the ideal place for hosting cattle. And so one of the first challenges that they faced was how to actually get dairy out into this location. Um, so uh, J. Henry Mayer hired Bob Bowen, who was a well-known uh, agriculturist uh, in the area. He came out and he really took hold of the land and managed it and really turned it into a thriving dairy. The Elkhorn Dairy Farm opened in 1915. And from 1915 until uh, the 1970s, they began producing um, tons of dairy. They actually became uh, the main distributor to the Watsonville area. So about 75% of the dairy in Watsonville stores in the Paro Valley was produced right here at Elkhorn Farm. I've got a photo. I'm hoping that I can successfully transmit it through the live. So this is a section of the Elkhorn Slough when it was a dairy. You can see the hill in the background there. I think possibly this photo is from a stretch of the South Marsh Trail. So if you've ever been out here on the trails, you kind of know where that oaky area is. I may have to look into it to figure out exactly where this spot was. But you can see there was lots of flatland, lots of dairy. And the way they accomplished, or the way um, the land manager accomplished getting all of these cows in and creating more pasture land as they expanded the dairy, was they actually came and they drained most of the marsh off. So they closed up, as you see along those railroad tracks, they closed up the entrance for water. They drained most of it out, leaving a small channel uh, through what is now called Parsons Slough. So if you look off to the left of your camera here, that kind of wide 
mud flat area. That's what we call Parsons Slough. There was a little bit of a channel running through there, but most of the water that you see out here was drained off. Uh, it was plugged up or diked, and then they were uh, able to create pasture land. The soil was pretty salty to work with because this is a saltwater environment. Uh, so they did have trouble growing some of the crops and getting the soil to kind of uh, be good enough to support the cattle on. Um, but like I said, they became a really industrious area. Uh, and for about 50 years, were providing, you know, a really huge portion of the dairy to our area here. Oops. Sorry, the technology. It's giving me a bit of a whirl. I wanted to pull up this quote by Bob Bowen, the land manager, that uh, he said, and this was in the 1930s, he said that we had the second most efficient dairy of our size, which is about 220, 230 cows. Now that was in 1930, and they were really efficient. By the 1960s, they had 650 to 700 cows at a time out on this area, and they had expanded widely the acreage of the farm. And these two small barns were built up. The smaller one could be storage. The bigger one was, of course, an area for shelter for the cows. But you can imagine that there were cattle all over this land and all over this area. Now, as the 1970s came on, uh, they began leasing the land to cattle, but the dairy slowed down its uh, production. And by the end of the 1970s, they sought to sell the farm. And in 1979, uh, the land was sold to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, who now owns it, um, although then they were the Department of Fish and Game. And uh, their first big struggle that they had to deal with coming into this space was that uh, all of this land that you see, this was filled in. Give me a sec, I have a nice picture. All of the land in front of you was filled in. So you can see Hummingbird Island, which I labeled out there, which is roughly out that way. And between the railroads and us, everything was filled in. And you can see the main channel on the opposite side. And all of that soil during the 50 plus years that it had you know, been drained of the salt water shrunk um, it sunk down, and when the water was reopened, which all of our water today on the inside of the slough or the reserve here comes in from the slough, right from this one entrance way off over here. Boop! So right about there, all of our water comes in. And when they did open the water back or the water flow back up in the 80s, they discovered that this area had sunk. And it sunk about, on average, about six feet. And that means that the pickleweed that creates the marsh could no longer grow in this system. And so, historically, we used to have this image of marsh. And I know it's probably a little funky to see through the computer, but you can see that all that green, that's all salt marsh habitat, which is pickleweed where the sea otters hang out and the little baby fish. By present day, we have a lot of brown, which is the mudflat. And now mudflat's a great habitat. There's lots of worms and great food out there, but there isn't the same benefits as you get from the salt marsh itself. And a big reason why we've lost all of our salt marsh is because this area was turned into a dairy. So we now uh, refocus our efforts we changed the way that we manage this land, just as it was changed to uh, become a thriving dairy. Now that it's part of Department of Fish and Wildlife, we change our land management use to be a thriving ecosystem or a thriving uh, natural space and habitat. Um, and we see what we have today. But it's very interesting how if you walk the trails, you can actually see evidence of that dairy out there, not just the barns, which are pretty obvious evidence of a dairy, but that we've kept because they still house animals like barn owls and great horned owls. You can also find things like milk bottles 
actually sunk down into the mud because all this area back here was drained off and it was just, you know, pasture land. Um, and when the water came back in, the mud reclaimed some of these uh, Elkhorn Dairy milk bottles, which I'll show you in a second. And uh, you can still at low tide see them as you're walking along the sides of the trail. They're embedded in there. They're, they're stuck in as a reminder of the history. And as you look around at the way the land shape, at the roads and the levees and the, the things that you notice, the next time you're out here, you'll see how the land has changed and the mark that that dairy production has made. Now, I'm gonna take you back over here. Forgive the technology. We're still kind of figuring it out. I just wanted to show you um, to wrap up a couple of cool items that I pulled out of um, our archive of stuff. So one of them, this is a super old school milk carton. And this is incredible to me because like, this is not what your usual milk carton is. This is really sturdy stuff um, and it's preserved. And you can see the Elkhorn Farm logo at the top. Sorry if it's a little bit backwards. Um, and this one's actually chocolate milk. So for those of you who don't want chocolate milk, I do also have the regular one as well. Grade A quality. And I like that it says on the front, from the Paro Valley's only independent dairy. Right, so think about how far we've come from this time. We also have, these are the milk bottles. And if you look closely, you can see the kind of embedding on the bottle that says Elkhorn Farm. And these we find, like I said, just embedded in the tides. It's something to look out for the next time you're here when we're reopened and you can walk the South Marsh Loop. Take a look for the lids of the bottles. Take a closer look at the barn. And uh, keep in mind the rich history that's behind this place. And that's all I got for you today. Uh, this is just an introductory snippet. Uh, the rest of our series, uh, Weaving Yesterdays, uh, will be presented by other folks here at the reserve, including our stewardship coordinator, Andrea Woolfolk, who's an incredible historian. Um, we'll feature different sites and different areas, um, and hopefully our 4G will hold out across all of them. Uh, but if you've joined me today, or if you join me later on today, thank you for watching, um, and tune in next time. Have a great day.